Good morning, Paquana Community Church, and welcome to my living room. Uh, this is a different setting than you've seen for several weeks. Uh, thought I'd change it up. I've also got a hardwired connection, which should make our signal better. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is Sunday morning. It is uh, 10 o'clock, and we meet here uh, for a message from the Word and a few uh, announcements for the church. Um, and as people gather, uh, I'll tell you that we now have two uh, options during the week uh, where you can join us live in groups online um, on Zoom. Uh, the first is uh, Tuesday, Tuesday at 12.30 and the second Thursday at 12.30. We call that our Bag Lunch Bible Study. And you're welcome to bring your lunch, uh, make your lunch, whatever you want to do. Um, I'm actually sitting here right now with my cup of coffee. And uh, so this is one of the things we can do. <coughs> I'm also suffering from allergies, not COVID. Um, and um, uh, then on Thursday afternoons at 5 o'clock, uh, we also gather for prayer for the church uh, for a half an hour. Uh, you can either do that on Zoom with us or in your home alone, whichever works best for you. Uh, but we'd love to have you participate with us live. Uh, we've had some really good times of prayer uh, as we've begun to do this the last few days. Um, finally, uh, to say that every other week we have an elder meeting that follows our morning worship time. That's my dog in the background. You have to put up with that. Now. And um, uh, the uh, the next elders meeting is going to be uh, at 11 o'clock next Sunday, the 17th. Uh, and that will be on Zoom as well. And I'll announce it again uh, when we do uh, have our worship next week. All are welcome to our elders meeting. So if you want to come and see how the, the church functions, uh, we would love to have you join us for that at 11 next Sunday. All right, those are all my announcements. Um, we, again, welcome you all. I see people are, are signing on and getting ready to worship with us. Uh, and so I'm going to begin us with a word of prayer, and then Jame is going to read the scriptures to us. Father, thank you for this gathering uh, that is uh, in many towns, in many places, uh, this uh uh, technology that makes this possible. We thank you for it. Uh, we know that it is uh, something which was in your mind long ago, that we would have this resource so that your church could survive in dark times, as it has in so many other ways, in other times. And so we ask that we would thrive and not just survive. We ask mm -hmm. that your church would be built up and that uh, people would come to know Christ as a result of this experience. Lord, we are aware of all who've been lost. We are so sad. We, uh, we grieve these losses daily, it mounts up. And we cry out to you, oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shorten these days, cause uh, the, the minds that are able to figure these things out to come up with remedies or a vaccine quickly. And God help us to endure and to love one another more deeply because you have called us to. We ask it in Jesus name, amen. All right, James is gonna to read to you uh, two chapters of Nehemiah. So settle in, grab a cup of coffee, and here we go. Good morning. The scripture this morning is uh, from the book of Nehemiah, chapters 5 and 6. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. 
For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall and we acquired no land and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days, all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I've done for this people. Now, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up, up to that time I had not set up the, the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem said to me, saying, sent to me saying, come, and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, no such things as you say have been done. For you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. 
Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehedabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so that they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them, for many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehohanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, <clears throat> and uh, thanks be for a, a wife who uh, is the daughter of an English professor and reads really well, because <laughs> some of those names are hard to pronounce. I can't do them at all. <clears throat> um, so welcome. Um, again, get settled, uh, and we'll get into the word right now. Uh, you might want to have uh, Nehemiah 5 and 6 in front of you because uh, it will help you as we go through, although I'm not going verse by verse. We're in the middle of a study of how uh, first Zerubbabel, Ezra, and then Nehemiah and their generation uh, rebuilt and renewed Jerusalem at the end of the period known as the Exile. It lasted roughly from uh, 587 B.C. to 520 B.C., a period of no less than 40 and maybe up to about 70 years, depending on which scholars you read. We've been focusing our attention these weeks on the task Nehemiah undertook of building a new wall around the city of Jerusalem around 445 BC. <clears throat> Zerubbabel and Ezra had already built a new and better temple in the heart of the city. Uh, but it was yet to be dedicated, and the city was completely vulnerable to any hostile attack. Nehemiah's task was not an easy one. He had first to get himself appointed as governor of Judah by Artaxerxes, who was king of the Babylonian Empire. And then he had to travel from northern Iraq back to the city that he himself had probably never seen, and somehow gained the trust of the people living in and around Jerusalem. This was a period of years that he did this, and he alludes to it in the passage we just read. <clears throat> Nehemiah's plan for building the wall around Jerusalem was a brilliant one. It was also a risky one. He had to convince the minority Jews who were living in the hills around the burnt out old city of Jerusalem that it was worth saving and that the worship of Yahweh was worth the time, the effort, and the money that it would take to accomplish the task. Was the faith of their ancestors worth saving? Was the broken down old city worth restoring? These questions didn't have obvious answers, and it took a period of 12 years for Nehemiah to work through this while he was the governor uh, of, of the now province of uh, Judah. 
Nehemiah made his appeal in two ways. He framed the call to build the wall as service to God. Remember, this wasn't the temple that they were building. Uh, this was a public works pro pro project, you might say. <clears throat> that work, the work of rebuilding the temple, had already been done. Nehemiah said, remember Yahweh, the Lord, who is great and awesome. So he reminds these people that God is God and that what they're about to do to build the wall is also a godly work. Building the temple is the obvious godly work. This is not so obvious and yet is still a godly work. If you do this work, he said, you are working for God. Second, he framed the work in ultra local terms. Nehemiah said, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. That's all in chapter four, and verse 14. Nehemiah also made sure that the people saw the work as ultra local. He didn't ask them to think about the whole two and a half miles of wall that needed to be built. He stationed each family or clan as a unit and gave them the task of building a portion of the wall that was directly opposite their house. All of them were living outside of the city in equally unprotected in the, in the Judean hills. In uh, 400 BC, the only defense against an invading enemy was to do one of two things. Either you had to flee from the enemy that was coming and go to some cave somewhere, and hide, uh, you know, up in the hillside, or you had to gather as a people within a walled city. That's why they built them. The walled cities created a fortress of protection for people. And most cities had walls. Jerusalem was no exception. But what had happened over time, because of the conquest back generations ago, the walls had been broken down, <clears throat> the temple destroyed. Now, after Zerubbabel and Ezra were allowed to come back and rebuild the temple, now Nehemiah had come to rebuild the wall to provide protection, not only for the temple, but for the people who could then come in from the hillside and gather in the protection of the city of Jerusalem. For them, building the wall was literally fighting for their own homes. Chapter five tells about the first of two tests that Nehemiah faced during the building of the wall. Chapter five is a kind of a self-contained unit and it's probably not in historical sequence. <clears throat> it, it, the reason we think that is because Nehemiah talks about how he had been the governor for 12 years and the wall was built in a relatively short amount of time. So we have to assume that it took him all of that time to build up trust with the people that he was working with as governor. And then when it was time, he hatched his plan. Chapter five uh, puts this uh, all in as a kind of a parenthesis. Chapters two, three, and four and then chapter six, tell of the actual work of building the wall. It, we should think of it this way. It's, it's kind of as if Nehemiah was saying to us, oh, and by the way, as if building the wall wasn't hard enough, this happened. The chapter begins with these words. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. That is to say, people started to gripe about the way things were going. It seems that at some point between the completion of the temple by Ezra and Zerubbabel and the building of the wall, there had been a famine in the land. That happened after Nehemiah was appointed as governor 
and before the work on the wall began. And so people started to complain to the person who seemed responsible for their welfare and their happiness. In, they laid it at the doorstep of Governor Nehemiah, of course. Now, Nehemiah breaks these complainers down, and I, I mean that generously, these complainers down into three classes of people. They are, uh, in verse 2 of chapter 5, you can follow along, they are people with large families and the assets enough to get through the crisis, but they're feeling the pinch. The second group of people in verse 3 are people who owned their own homes but had run out of money and had to take high interest loans in order to survive. And then in verses 4 and 5, people who had maxed out their credit, had lost their fields, and that was the source of their income, understand. They'd lost their fields to lenders and literally had to indenture their family members to somebody else or starve. Those three classes of people are very important to this story. And look, it, it isn't that they had an unreasonable complaint. That flushing sound that you hear is your assets going down the drain because of high taxes, sky high interest rates, or worse. And here we are in the middle of a depression, and this guy, this new governor, wants us to build a wall for protection? Verses 7 through 11 go on to tell a rather complicated story that goes along with this. It's a story of public greed. <clears throat> when the complaints of the people reached Nehemiah, he called the local authorities together for a meeting. Nehemiah blasted them for profiting off of people's hard luck. These people had become so greedy. These officials had become so greedy, Nehemiah said that they were even selling their own children into slavery, knowing that Nehemiah would use government funds to buy them back. This cycle of selling and buying back had been going on for some time. It, you might call it today a government-funded kickback scheme run by people who profited off of the famine. Before Nehemiah could even think about getting the people to build the wall, he had to bring this class warfare to an end. What a mess. Nehemiah exposed the scheme for what it was. He told these officials to give the money back, told them the, that he hadn't taken a cent of salary himself and wouldn't profit from any of this, and that in fact, he had been feeding over 150 people regularly out of his own pocket. Some of the people that he was feeding were among the greedy extortioners. These practices simply had to stop. Nehemiah exhorted the whole lot of them to join God's cause under pain of oath. Notice that he doesn't reject them. He doesn't send them away. He doesn't tell them, you are anathema in Israel. You are, you're out of here. He doesn't put them under a sentence of death. He works with them. He invites them into God's plan. <clears throat> Remarkably, every last one of those greedy lenders agreed to Nehemiah's terms and signed on the dotted line, they said, Amen. That's in verse 13 of chapter 5. They said, We will do what you say. And they did it. Any leader who can forge a coalition of nobles and officials of the middle class, lower class workers, and the indigent poor, and get them all to put 100% of their energy into a public works project, while not taking a dime of salary, deserves a medal, in my mind. At the end of chapter five, all that Nehemiah says is this, remember for my good, O God, all that I have done for this people. This prayer, is so remarkable because it's just between Nehemiah and God. 
he's not tooting his own horn. He doesn't say it at a public assembly. He, he says it on the side. It's not part of the gathering of the nobles. He simply marks the end of this episode with prayer. The second test that Nehemiah faced was, was rather more of a simple one. The work on the wall that Nehemiah talked about in chapters two, three, and four, that concludes in chapter six, was not done without tests, without external objectors, people outside of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah was working with the people to try and gain their trust, but he had these people who were beyond their area, beyond Judah, who were up in Samaria, Sanballat and, and Tobiah, notably, and their associates, and they were watching all that was happening. And uh, as they began to build the wall, Sanballat and, and Tobiah freaked out. And, uh, and they plotted once and again in chapters two, three, and four, and then finally again in chapter six, they plot one more final time to try and get this wall not built, to try and get Nehemiah to cease. The people were right at the end of a 52-day marathon to complete the wall when Shemaiah tried to scare Nehemiah into abandoning the work by saying that his enemies were about to overrun the city before the gates could be put in place. He tried to entice Nehemiah to take refuge in the Holy of Holies in the temple where presumably he'd be safe. Of course, this unrighteous plot had been actually to get Nehemiah somewhere alone to kill him. And, uh, Shemaiah was in the employ of Sanballat and Tobiah. That's why he was sequestered in his house. He wasn't part of the work. He was watching along with them, and he had become a, uh, an accomplice to them in trying to end this work. Nehemiah's character rang true throughout the whole thing. Even when people were suggesting that he would be the best candidate to take over as the next king of the Jews, Nehemiah refused to play politics. I'm not a candidate for anything, and I'm doing the work at my own expense. That was Nehemiah's character. Their idea that he wanted to become king, that he wanted to, to lead the Jews in a rebellion, was pure fiction. He knew it. The people working on the wall knew it. He wanted Sanballat and Tobiah to know it too. Great people retain their reputation for greatness long after they're gone because their goal wasn't to build their own name brand legacy. In our times, when George Washington resigned his commission as commander in chief of the army at the end of the American Revolution, King George III is reported to have said, if he does that, then he is the greatest man in the world. Humility, selfless leadership, unwavering obedience to God and his ways. That's how the wall got built in just 52 days. And I think Nehemiah puts chapter five in its place there to demonstrate over again to the people in this little vignette that had happened years ago, probably, what his character was and how it worked out in, in real terms. Does this story sound familiar? One reason I told you all that is so that I can tell you this with confidence. The world-shaking crisis of COVID-19 will not be the end of civilization as we know it. 
it will not be the end of Christ's church. And it will not be the end of PCC. How can I say that with confidence? I'm not a prophet, and I hope you don't think I am. The, the realities that we are going through would lend you to think that perhaps that was the case. I myself have had moments where I thought, this is all coming crashing down on us. The, the, the virus is going to take over. The world is coming to an end. Nothing can be further from the truth. I've seen uh, the, the church of Jesus Christ worldwide told that they couldn't meet in person and that they were being marginalized yet again. Nothing could be further from the truth. I felt as, as recently as mid-January that it was time for PCC to close its doors. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look at the selfless acts of courage and character being done by people around the globe who are working on this problem, the problem of COVID-19. Let's break it down and let's understand that pandemic will not end civilization. If you look at the politicians and the profiteers, people that Nehemiah highlighted and gathered together and scolded. You'll despair. The problems that we face are not political. The problems we face and that people all over the globe are coming together right now to work on are to try and build a wall of protection in order that humanity can survive. That work is often hampered by politicians who, like Sanballat and Tobiah in Nehemiah's day, care more for position and power that they possess than they do for the good of the people that they are supposed to serve. The lesson of Nehemiah, though, is that not all people who hold office think that way. Nehemiah was a provincial governor in a vast empire. He'd formerly worked in the palace and was an intimate advisor to King Artaxerxes. This was a man of no little consequence. And had he wanted it, he could have positioned himself as a vassal king, subservient to Artaxerxes anytime he wanted. He could have established himself as king of, of the Jews. He could have become the king of Judea. After rebuilding the wall, and gaining the confidence of the people, 12 years as governor, builds the wall, restores the city to its former glory. He could have done that. He could have, have proclaimed himself as king, but he didn't. When Sanballat and Tobiah suggested the, that kingship was his end game, Nehemiah rejected the thought as pure fiction. You want to see the hope for humanity in this crisis? Then look to those who have no title, who are working in labs and universities and in obscure posts in governments all, all over the world of all kinds. Look to people who decline greater position for themselves and who are simply doing the work. Listen for the voices of people who challenge us to be better than we have been, who ask us to rise to the occasion, and who give us a good reason why we are fighting for our brothers, our sons, our daughters, our spouses, and our homes. Look to them, and you'll find people who are signing on to the work that God has for this generation. When you look to them, you will also see that they have broken down the crisis for us, and they have made the fight ultra-local. Most people's minds aren't big enough to take in a global coalition any more than the people around Jerusalem could understand the task of building a two and a half mile wall in Nehemiah's day. 
There are things you and I are being called upon to do right now, and there are things that we haven't even yet been called on to do that are ultra-local and contribute to the building of a wall of protection in this crisis, no less than Nehemiah asked the people of his day. If we are to emerge stronger and better from this situation, our local coalition must be without politics. And it must include nobles and officials, the middle class, lower class workers, and the indigent poor. That is what will save civilization as we know it. That is what will make civilization better. Will this crisis be the end of Christ's church? That's the second point. Some have suggested this is all an evil plot by godless people somewhere to kill the church by making it illegal for us to meet, by making it irrelevant for us to meet, by putting us all on Zoom and Facebook and containing us in small picture screens. If anybody thinks that us not meeting in large groups could possibly be the end of faith in Christ and of the worship of the triune God. They're ignorant of 2000 years of church history. That game plan was tried as early as the late first century, and it has been repeated with persecutions, with genocides, with threats, with murders, with whole congregations herded into their churches and burned alive all down through the years. That game plan has been used by totalitarians and kings and strong leaders of all types who cared more about propagating their own legacy than caring for the people. They have tried to control what we say. They have tried to control where we say it. They have tried to control how we worship and what the content of our prayers are. They've tried to marginalize the church. They've tried to help us to uh, abandon the church. They've tried to make it seem like Christ's church is on the way out. And yet the true church persists. Why? Well, if the church was the invention of people, it'd be easy to take it down. So many clubs and teams have come and gone down through the centuries just that way. I was struck this week by the fact that I haven't heard hardly anything in in seven weeks about baseball, my favorite sport. I love watching baseball. I even love watching someone else's baseball at this point, but I haven't heard anything about it. Why? It's man's invention. It's not God's invention. It's an entertainment, something we do just because we want to do it. And we pay people very well to do it. The church isn't man's invention. Individual churches do come and go over time. But the church of Jesus Christ endures because this is God's plan. This is God's doing. This is God's We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, not the United States, the church. We are the people, the peculiar people of God that Peter talks about in his letter, called by God for the praise of his glory. The nations and the angels watch the church. And as Nehemiah said, they perceive that this work has been accomplished with the help of our God over and over and over for 2,000 years. And then come the, the questions. What if the government never blows the all clear? What if this goes on for a very long time? And what if we're told that people can never meet in a room if they can't socially distance and keep six feet apart? What if that's the future of humanity? What if we have to do it that way? How will megachurches gather? 
The answer is, if that happens, and I have no confidence that it will, if that happens, megachurches will come up with a new way to gather. Any work that God has instituted can find a way through in the midst of crisis. It can find a way through in the midst of opposition. It can find the way through. Another answer is, look to small churches in COVID time and glory in the way that God has positioned his church. Something like 60% of all churches worldwide have fewer than 100 members. And that brings us to PCC, a small church. Will this be the end of PCC? I don't think so. Uh, for one thing, uh, we're uniquely positioned to regather once they blow the all clear. There are very easy ways that we could, with the number of people that usually show up on a Sunday morning, enter the church, go in, experience worship together, at a distance of six feet apart in the space that's been provided for us by God, and then leave if we had to. But we could do it. We can do it, and I'm sure we will. We'll do it when they tell us it's okay to do it. And we'll do it when God tells us it's okay to do it, and not a second before. When COVID struck, we were just beginning to rebuild and renew as a church. In uh, January of 2020, we came to a point that I would call our Rubicon. Now, the Rubicon is a, is a, a, a word that um, those of you who, who may not have ever heard the term refers to an event in the life of Julius Caesar uh, and how he uh, be became uh, king, if you will, of, uh, of all of Italy. Uh, but figuratively, it means committing irrevocably to a risky or revolutionary course of action. When we refer to a Rubicon, it's that. We prayed it out. We decided to be a church, even when we couldn't see how we were going to be a church. The parenthetical story in chapter five of Nehemiah's godly coalition, built in the midst of a secular cultural crisis, is our story. God is rebuilding and renewing PCC in the midst of this great parenthetical secular crisis of COVID-19. The work has not been stalled even before it really began. It hasn't. God is at work in the midst of this crisis. And if we will stand firm together with the God who has called us, you and I will look back one day and see the great thing God has done with us. You see, the weirdest thing has been happening to PCC. During the COVID crisis, during the COVID crisis, this has been happening. Since we stopped meeting in person together, we've become more connected, not less. Every week I hear people saying that they got a nice card from someone or they got a nice phone call from somebody or someone stopped at their door and they talked through the screen at each other. I've had people just show up at my door and, and uh, have a cup of coffee with me. We haven't lost people. We've gained them, oddly because of this technology. There are people watching us right this minute who never had anything to do with PCC before the COVID crisis. One person who's watching us lives in North Carolina. We've had people tuning in from Florida. We've had people watching us from Massachusetts. Why? Because here we are. They're seeing the genuineness of our faith. They're seeing the work that God is doing among us, and they are drawn to it. Our two online Bible studies each week are growing larger, not smaller. There are people showing up. There are people getting involved in the ways we can get involved. Our new prayer group is something that we haven't been able to organize for nine years. I've, I've talked about having prayer groups before, but they never got any traction. But now, because of this, in the midst of this, 
people want to pray. People want to pray together. And on Thursday afternoons at five for a half an hour, we're calling the church to all pray together. Now, you may not enjoy extemporaneous prayer online. That's fine. But if you are in any way associated with PCC, and that's all of you who are watching right now, I challenge you, set aside 5 to 5.30 every Thursday afternoon. Join your church in prayer. You may do this alone. You may do this on a walk. You may do this wherever God has you. You can also come into our Zoom meeting and do it with us. The elders have committed just last week to calling every person in our directory that isn't a part of one of these regular meetings. We're calling them to make sure that they are resourced, to make sure that they, un that they feel connected. It's a little easier to feel connected when you're in and out of these Zoom meetings. But we want to make sure everyone associated with PCC feels that connection. And so we divvied up our, our uh, directory and the elders have taken it upon themselves within any, any given two week period while this crisis is going on. Every one of those people is going to get a phone call. People have spontaneously taken it upon themselves to send out cards. This week, I got a card. That was amazing. I loved that. And it was a beautiful card. People are checking in with one another. I told the elders that if you want to know what to say to somebody and you don't know them all that well, uh, a really good question, one that my mentor taught me, is, how's your soul? Yeah, it sounds a little funny, but you'd ask that about how their health was going. You might say to someone, you know, are you well? Within the church, we should be asking one another all the time. Are you spiritually well? How's your soul? Do you need anything? That's the other question. As you call people, as you interact, ask both of those questions. It's so important. Is there anything you need? And I'll say that to you who are watching. If there's anything you need, please call one of us. You should know my telephone number, and though I'm not going to act as the hub on all this, but you can call me, 860-881-5350. Any time of the day. Well, not any time of the night, but any time of the day. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, working together to let the neighborhood know that we are here and, that, and to tell them when we're going to begin again to meet together in person. We haven't set the date yet. We don't know how that's going to uh, work itself out, but we're putting things in motion so that that will happen. We're going to do a narrow area mailing with a card that invites people. And we're going to challenge each one of you to be a part of that outreach as it happens. See, God is at work. God is building the wall, even as we're in the midst of this crisis. God is building a wall of protection around PCC, not to keep us from invading enemies, but that we might be a display of his glory. With all the uncertainty swirling around us in the world and in our individual lives, the word from God that's most significant, the one that strikes me the most in this passages, these passages from Nehemiah, is Nehemiah 6, verse 10. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Look, continue as you have. Connect all the more. Connect, connect, connect. Pray, pray, pray. Let us build the wall as God has called us to do. The first Sunday that we met this way on Facebook was March 22nd. 
That means we've been doing this work, building this wall, becoming what God wants us to become for 50 days. Nehemiah writes, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. Amen. You have a great Sunday. Uh, if, uh, if you are uh, out and about, make sure you do it safely. Wear a mask. Uh, enjoy the company of family and friends and enjoy the fellowship of our God. We pray in Jesus. Uh, bye, everyone. See you next week.